be invited in to speak today, or allowing us to speak today. Um, my name is Fiona, and we're going to talk to you about the Green Heritage Project, a venture called Vikings and Veterans Rosters. It's being called the Community Archaeology Project. Um, and today we're going to talk to you a little bit about the theories of the um, project, and we'll give you a little bit of a flavour of what we've been doing. Um, and also think about the balance between the community bit and the archaeology bit. Um, and I'll talk to you about a tea towel later on. So, a look at projects out there under the spectrum of community archaeology. Um, there are also a huge spectrum and types of projects, just showing how each community um, is able to produce and create something very different. Our project was conceived and developed and managed by the community um, with varying degrees of professional input. But who represents the community? Well, the heritage projects went by themselves. Um, and we, we, we realised that we don't necessarily represent the whole community, but we are members of it. And we kind of thought hard, long and hard about this and realised that um, we won't be too hard on ourselves because projects don't run themselves and sometimes need a little bit of help and support to do it. Um, and that's why um, you can only volunteer for a certain level of time, really. And when kind of money is free in, time is free in, and you're only volunteers, you sometimes need a little bit of help. <coughs> you have to admit that North by Heritage literally empowered our community by giving me some money to enable me to go into the community and work within the community with, a, with the people that I know um, to, to um, scope out the potential for the project and then write the funding application, which, as everybody knows, does take a lot of time. Um, oh, I was getting bad. Um, and of course, coordination, by its own definition, um, sometimes you need fewer people to actually be able to organise something like that. And so um, it, it's really important that if you're going to have some people organising the project, it's really important to stay in close touch with, those, with the community. And that's why sometimes I think it's much easier to be on the community yourself, um, to make sure that your fingers on the pulse and you're really hearing the views of local people as you're, as you're working within it. Another aspect of community-led archaeology, we believe, is that communities do um, have a, a, a valid reason to be interested in and investigate sites that they're interested in, and not necessarily the types of sites that um, are kind of strategic national priorities. Um, we were given quite a lot of stick for excavating a deserted rural settlement that was lived in until about 1916. Uh, but we're very proud to say that an eminent, uh, not an archaeologist, an eminent expert in his field did talk about our investigation at the end of the Heimel Lang project as a beacon of light in a dark tunnel, particularly in relation to post medieval ceramics. So now everybody knows who that, that eminent professional was. So we quote him all the time. Um, that's our one of the uh, managements. So, um, of course, amateurs just like me in the city, because uh, we're not professional archaeologists and have no training in archaeology at all. Um, we do feel that it's it's a, a valid thing, and we're able to be able to do documentary research and other types of investigations. But when you actually want to dig, which we did want to do, literally, into the ground, we realised that we needed professional help. And um, therefore, we needed money. Um, and um, this can sometimes uh, raise kind of some conflicting priorities. Um, we started to sort of analyse what it was we were actually wanting to achieve out of this project. And we, we realised that for the community, um, there are a range of different priorities. And one of them, obviously, is to, to look and understand the local features. And for people to investigate their kind of the people that lived on the land and people they used to be related to in the community, to be their ancestors. Another one of the priorities is clearly about social interaction and a feeling of uh, being with like-minded people and being outside, getting outside and health well-being, all these speaking jargon words, but it's actually true. These are, we started to think, well, what is a priority? Find an artifact, start to be a moment that's people have been mentioning. And then, of course, learning from each other and learning about the landscape that we live in. When we, and 
um, start to think, well, what, what, what's the difference between when we start to work with professional operators? Because we employ professional operators on our projects, um, and we've actually employed a range of different um, archaeologists and experts within the project. Um, oh, I've got to say, pride, sense of pride in the landscape. Sorry, I've got to use the The final click. Um, when we started looking at other priorities, now this is this was our perception of what we thought maybe the, the professional archaeologists were after when we got involved in that with them. Um, possibly it's about them wanting to be close to the community and listening to communities and how they work. Perhaps it's about getting paid work and getting some good archaeological results and maintaining a good reputation and publishing reports. And so on the face of things. They're not actually very um, similar, are they? They're quite different, those two sets of priorities. And we realised that um, over the, the, the years, we, we had to be able to reconcile those things. And really, it's, it's an opportunity for partnership rather than conflict. So um, when we think that we did achieve, achieve that, um, we can ask some of the people that we worked with. Maybe they don't actually. Maybe they hate us. <laughs> anyway, one of the other aspects of community-led archaeology, I think, is this thing that I think has been coming across a lot in, in Northern talks this morning and afternoon, is the, the, the fact that heritage um, does belong to everybody, and we believe that as much as the left person, and realise that how important it is to ensure that um, the information that we gather is not only um, disseminated properly um, and well and in different ways, but also um, the, the project is, is, is promoted and the results and that there's a whole range of different ways for dissemination to take place. And we do feel that's really, really important. And one example is through imagery, um, this is a book that we produce, photographic imagery, just talking to somebody who, um, uh, over the coffee break who was talking about final reports being performed theatrically, which I think uh, some people from North Light might be doing already. Um, so not even putting anything in front of the scene, having it all done through drama. So um, John Hume would probably enjoy that. <laughs> so um, this is where the sort of the, the tea towel bit comes in. Um, the sort of we came up with a journey project that we wanted to make sure we wanted to engage people in, a, in different ways. We didn't want just to sort of have um, journals and, and articles written up and things filed away in museums and in dark alcoves. And so we kind of as a joke said, well, about getting the information on a tea towel. Um, but it eventually became a bit synonymous with, um, with, with kind of the community aspirations. And so I have here today the one and only uh, Hidden Heritage Tea Towel, which we produce, which is become a bit of a, a, bit of a joke. <laughs> budgets. 
and responding to their marginal requirements is, is lowering the feet, as everybody knows. So, as I said before, we do think it's perfectly valid for communities to investigate what interests them, even if it's just that there are rumours that Vikings were living under the, or buried under the gate posts of the hotel grounds, so don't play in those grounds, they never appeared, or whether their great granny used to live in a deserted, tumble down um, house on the our isthmus. Um, that kind of um, interest can easily be dismissed sometimes, and the the intangible heritage, the stories that go along with the landscape or a community, sometimes are the things that bind the community together. And so any kind of project we felt um, had to be and is meaningful to us. And it's those <coughs> stories that are passed down word of mouth that has inspired a lot of this project. Um, and so as you can see, it is a, it is a beautiful place. Um, our landscape project was looking at the isthmus, the piece of land that connects um, Lochabon here, the larger uh, body of water, to Loch Lomond in the background. Um, it was it was used over the years, and it has been used over the years. Um, 1750, all these back, military roads. 1820, there was a proposed canal that was going to traverse the area linking the two bodies of water, it never got built. Um, and in the late 1800s, when the West Highland Railway was built, of course, we had the railway line across it. And today, we've got footpipes and we've got major um, uh, West Coast routes that, that, that traverse our isthmus as well as the railway line. And it's this piece of landscape that, that we were wanting to look at. And, of course, we cannot forget the saga from 1263 that inspired the project. And we used it as a kind of hook to hook people in. Although we were looking at all ages, we decided to record um, all of the people on these. It's not just the, the Viking Cortes group, but here's an example of um, what is a, is a later route that's by Augustine Magnus in his name. Um, so so there are a lot of reasons why we felt this piece of land is significant. And hence, the hidden heritage of a landscape project, conventional Viking to record trustless. Just really, really quickly to look at the budget. The budget was a 90,000 budget. And um, people um, often are surprised to hear that as it's often promoted as a community archaeology project, it's actually only about a third of the um, funding went on actual archaeology. Um, that was all by Heritage, who's done a wonderful job with us. Um, and of course, the archaeology is the public face. Of, of the project, which of course everyone knows, there's a whole lot more that goes along with it. And um, there's this uh, these range of issues like involvement, and engaging different people in the wider community. I, I can't go through all the things we've been doing over the year. Um, the work with the schools is imperative, and the workshops that we've been organising, and of course the publicity, and the admin, which is the, my favourite contention, the amount of work um, and, and time it takes to, to actually maintain and coordinate the project. So, I shall pass you on to Sue very quickly. Thanks, Gillian. Um, okay, I get the um, unenviable job of trying to sum up uh, a year's work by predicting the results in about 10 minutes, I think, but I will do my best. Um, so, just a very quick run through what we do. We, we started off the project back in January by running a series of workshops, with, which kind of had a twofold aim. One was obviously it's a great way of doing all the background research to give you kind of the, the groundings for the, the subsequent field work, but also it's a really good way of getting another whole sector of the community involved. We found a lot of the sort of local older people uh, would maybe come along to some of the workshops, especially workshops on things like place names. Uh, you know, people who don't want to come out and get muddy and cold and wet, but they're, they're going to really enjoy all the documentary stuff. Um, we also did um, surveying up the top right there. Um, several weeks in a very cold spring with horizontal snow, and goodness knows what else, uh, having walked several miles, or many miles, I think, uh, walkover survey, we did some plane table survey, we did some geophysics, um, basically just trying to record, as you see down at the bottom left there, anything we can find, any evidence of anything man-made on our isthmus. It might be exciting things like gravestones, or it might be ditches. We have lots of ditches, you know, we, we have a very wet, uh, area, so you know, anything that people wanted to do involved digging ditches to control the water. And we have done lots of stuff with the local school, which I'm not going to go into, it's another whole talk in itself. This particular slide is Dr. Colleen Beatty, 
from Glasgow University showing one of the, the young children a genuine Viking artifact. And I think you can see from that that she's, she's actually not quite prepared to let go of it, just in case. <laughs> uh, but, but the kids were really excited to get to that whole actual Viking thing. So that was really, really good. I'm not sure I know how to make this. Oh, yeah, there we go. And what else did we do? As Fiona said, part of, quite a lot of the budget went on publicity. Um, you know, both before the project to make people come along, but all, all the way through, we made sure that we advertised where we were and what we were doing so that the local people always knew where we were. Um, you know, and, and there's no point in organising all these workshops and all these digs if people don't know where you are and they don't know what you're doing uh, and nobody signs up to come along. So you, you've got to kind of um, keep a fairly high profile. Uh, and we did dig right at the top there. Uh, we actually ended up digging three different sites for one week each. We could have chose to dig one site in more depth for three weeks, but we felt it kind of um, it gave the community a bit, a bit of a better opportunity to look at a wider range of sites. So um, I think maybe it was a bit of a nightmare from the archaeologist's point of view. We spent a lot of time backfilling and deturfing, but, um, but I think probably it was a good decision in the end. Um, we've also done things like a bit of environmental analysis. Um, here we are, some from AOC archaeology, uh, attempting to find some peat in our landscape for us to do a peat analysis. Uh, and we also got people in to do an analysis of the trees uh, and some tree dating, which I'll mention later. And again, as other people have mentioned throughout the day, um, <laughs> there's many different ways as we can to try and get people involved. Music, food and beer. We, we got a local brewery to come and brew some beer, uh, especially for the project, so this was good. Uh, and we did manage to get around to digging. This particular site was actually in front of the uh, primary school, which was great. The primary school kids are coming out of school and coming by to see what we're digging. Uh, we actually dug here because we had records that the Farlands had, had, a, had their castle here in the 1500s. Uh, and unfortunately, we didn't find any sign of a castle, but we did find um, over 50 pieces of beautiful work flint. Lots of them just <coughs> the remnants or debitage, as we found this lovely new word. Um, all bits like this. So this is the, the first of really good evidence for prehistoric use on our isthmus. We don't have, unfortunately, we don't have any prehistoric structures, but we do know that the people were there, so uh, maybe we have to keep looking for prehistoric structures. Uh, moving on a bit, this again is our isthmus from Google Earth, and um, it has been the property of the Carmen Farland from like the early 1200s, like to the late 1700s. Um, but it's called Arica, or Arica and Tar, but the parish of Arica. But nobody locally was really very sure why it was called that. Uh, but we did have a fantastic place name workshop by Simon Taylor from Glasgow. Uh, and now we're pretty definite that it comes from the term caricate, which is uh, as much land as a team of oxen can plow in a year and a day. So that's quite nice. It kind of gives you an idea of the extent of our, our area. Uh, and the other thing that came up from this, which we loved, was that we came across this document that suggested that people pay for their rental in cheeses, two cheeses from each house in which there may be cheese. <laughs> we think this definitely ought to be reinstated. I, mean, I know somebody who'd be quite in favor of that. Uh, and here we go. Uh, Fiona mentioned that you know we have this. That, that there is this local belief that the Vikings dragged their ships across here from Loch Long to Loch Lomond before the Battle of Largs. But nobody was really very sure what the evidence was for this. But we did manage to, to do a bit of uh, background documentary research and find this saga. Uh, and often you might think sagas they're just stories. You know yeah, that's no good evidence at all. But in fact, this saga was only written two years after the actual event. So we, we're pretty happy that that's a, an accurate reflection of an event that really, that really did happen. Um, part of the other the, the local legend is that the, the Vikings came across, they fought the local McFarlands, and all, all the dead Vikings were buried in the local graveyard. And you think, well, that's quite interesting, but unfortunately there is no evidence of Vikings in our local graveyard. Uh, virtually all the stones are McFarlands, and they date from 1750 onwards, apart from this one stone in the foreground. And if you go and look at that on a day like today, you can hardly see anything on it. But it was obviously quite interesting. Um, so, at, at the risk of getting arrested, we kind of went out one night to the graveyard with a very bright torch and a camera uh, and managed to get what we thought was a really very beautiful photograph of it. Um, and uh, a couple of experts, David Caldwell and Mark Wall, have been out and had a look and said that this man might date to the 1500s. Uh, and we were sufficiently inspired by that that we got somebody to come and do uh, a beautiful, proper archaeological drawing of it for us so that maybe we can 
move this forward and see if we can find out a bit more about it. Um, okay, also in the 1500s, as I said, we, we, we had records that the, the McFarlands lived in Tarbot at this time, and here we have a, a description of the McFarland house, which doesn't make it sound very grand. Um, but it has to be said that this description was actually written about two or three hundred years after he was actually supposed to have lived there. So, you know, maybe it doesn't actually reflect the real situation at all. Um, so we dug and we didn't find any evidence of the house, but we did find other things. This is a pistol ball, which apparently has been, it was fired but didn't hit anything, I believe. So uh, somebody obviously wasn't a very good shot, but you know, it's evidence of people, you know, violent things happening on our bit of land. And we did find this, this beautiful amber bead. Uh, and we've been told this is what's called a lama bead. Uh, and we, you know, we've decided to reinstate the tradition. Here we have one. Apparently they were worn to ward off evil spirits. Um, and the, the nice thing is that um, potentially there, there are stories that suggest these things were, were although they were used in like the sort of 17 and 1800s, that they were actually older things, like Viking things or Bronze Age things that have been found and reused. Um, another quick thing, this is General Roy's map, and if you notice over in Arica, a beautiful designed landscape there with, you know, boundaries and trees. And during our walk over the survey, we did indeed find lots of big old trees growing on boundary walls, and thought it'd be great to know if these trees were actually the trees that were planted in the mid-1750s. So we got um, Corinne Mills to come out, and she looked at the trees, she took some tree falls, and was actually able to confirm that these very trees still growing there were planted 1750 to 1760. So I think that's lovely that these trees are still there after all that time. Uh, on a more mundane level, you know, the, the lairds now are living in their grand houses, but the, the, the peasant folk are living in much more humble houses like this one we excavated. Uh, the man at the back with the red coat, uh, his great 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 grand did indeed live here, apparently. And the man at the front, Peter McFarlane, and Peter McFarlane, came all the way from America to come and join the Nobel Peace. Um, so that was quite nice. And this is the sort of stuff we're finding, you know, very mundane domestic pottery. Uh, okay, so the trouble with uh, running an archaeology project is that people think when you finish digging that that's it, uh, and it's all finished, but very far from it. Uh, we still have a lot of things to do. Uh, we got the volunteers involved in doing some post excavation analysis. We are producing uh, maps to run a heritage trail around our landscape so people can go out and explore. We're producing a tapestry, which is going to be like the great tapestry of Scotland, but not quite so great. <laughs> We're still doing a lot of stuff with school. Uh, we have both builders coming to build a replica of the the playground next week. And here we have, we have a conference happening May the 10th, 2014. Anybody who would like to come, we would love to see you. Um, uh, we don't take ourselves too seriously, we always have time for a good class to see. So, the last slide, almost the last slide, okay. Uh, we do our best to make sure, we wouldn't like to think that our grant runs out in June, that that's going to be the end of it. We hope there's some legacy. Of course, we'll have found some new historical information, which we will have put into promotion materials, like beautiful tea towels, which we hope are going to adorn people's kitchens for years to come. Uh, we're going to have books, we're going to have the Heritage Trail, we're going to have leaflets and the website to promote the Heritage Trail. Uh, we hope we've empowered the community by giving them a bit more information and the confidence to go out there and tell the people about it. Uh, and we hope we will raise the awareness of the landscape, of, you know, of people's awareness of the landscape. If the kids go to school every morning in the bus, drive through the landscape and look out the bus window and see something other than just a green field, then, you know, that would be really good. That would be a big plus point. And on a, on a really grandiose scheme, our Community Development Trust, who actually fronted this project, uh, is in the midst of looking into the feasibility of building a visitor centre, which would have a heritage focus and would therefore be able to use lots of the information we have found as part of the project. So that's it. Thank you. Thank you for thank you.